Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Uh, welcome everyone to this online conversation about Black Lives Matter, COVID-19, the future of aid. It's an ambitious agenda. Welcome to those of you on Zoom, uh, about 600 at the moment. Um, people are also watching on Facebook. And uh, my name is Heba Ali. I run the New Humanitarian. This event kicks off a, a series of reflections and discussions that we will be hosting on our website and in these kinds of events over the next few weeks and months called Rethinking Humanitarianism. Uh, we will drop some links uh, into the chat of, of some of the early stories as part of that series. Um, but the reason we're pursuing that is uh, multiple, uh, as usual. Um, this year marks our 25th anniversary. We've been reporting about some of the world's biggest crises, as well as the international community's response to them for 25 years now. And given the, the kind of self-reflection that we've been seeing in the sector um, in recent years as, as needs skyrocket and aid budgets are stretched, we thought that this 25 year mark was an opportunity to look back on the evolution of crises over the last quarter century, um, as well as what we can learn from the past to, to inform the future. So that was the plan. And then uh, COVID-19 hit, then George Floyd was murdered and the world, it feels like has been uh, pretty radically transformed. We will see if that lasts. Um, but certainly this is a moment in which everything is being rethought. And I think those, those two shocks are the latest, for me anyway, in a, in a series of developments we've seen over recent years from Brexit to what Donald Trump has exposed as the weakness of American democratic institutions that have really torn down the illusion that the West, however you define that, is a beacon of human rights, of stability, of, of welfare that the rest of the world should learn from. And uh, what we're here to discuss today is the serious challenges that this poses for an international aid sector that is more or less founded on that premise. So we're not here to discuss Trump. This is not an anti-Trump fest. Uh, we're not even here to discuss the United States, although we will certainly talk about it. But rather, as the dust settles on these two major global crises, what uh, what do they mean for the way we define humanitarian crises and the way the world responds to them? As, as many of you probably know, we rebranded last year from Era News to the New Humanitarian in part to signal a commitment to do precisely that, to interrogate the definition of humanitarian crises and humanitarianism writ large, which I'm kind of loosely defining as saving lives, allevi alleviating suffering, maintaining human dignity of, of people in need. What does that look like in the modern era? Um, in an age when vulnerability is global, in an age when suffering is caused just as much by injustice than by a lack of food and water. What, in that context, what does humanitarianism done right look like? And what do COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter expose or, or help us understand about the international aid sector? Um, and then lastly, I suppose, what opportunities do these two crises provide to the sector to um, change in a way that it, its fundamental structures in a way that it has long talked about but struggled to do. Um, we've already got a number of questions from readers in advance. Rebecca asks, is the US a failed state? Uh, we have a question around how the pandemic and anti-racism protests have changed our minds about global development. And he asks how nonprofits and humanitarian organizations can foster greater international solidarity from Jake, uh, how can we start to decolonize aid organizations? Philip asking how healing from white supremacy can be integrated into reimagined ways of working. So those are the kinds of questions we're gonna try to get into over the course of the discussion. But uh, disclaimer from the very beginning, this is a massive topic and I'm always um, too ambitious in what I think we can cover. So we might not get through um, everything and certainly all of your questions, but we'll do our best. I'm going to do a quick round of introductions. Uh, we have a lot of speakers and that was because we felt this was an issue in which it was really important to have a diversity of views, both from the US and also internationally. Um, so bear with me as I run through them all. Candace Rondeau is joining us from Washington DC. Uh, 
I first met Candace uh, almost a decade ago, my God, now in Afghanistan, where she was working for the International Crisis Group. She's now a senior fellow at both the Center on the Future of War and New America's International Security Program. She's also a columnist at World Politics Review. And um, I'll drop into the chat uh, a recent piece she published with them where um, what she called the, the looming nightmare in the United States both as a, as a biracial American and as someone who analyzes crisis for a living. Um, Uzo Iweala is with us from New York. I first met Uzo in Geneva in 2017 when he gave a rather provocative speech to um, a rich and white Swiss audience on why their philanthropy should be recast as reparations. Suffice it to say, uh, that didn't go over so well, and we'll drop the, the link into, into the chat if you want to have a, a read of that speech, it's, it's well worth it. Uh, Uzo is a Nigerian-American doctor, author, and now heads up the Africa Center in New York, which works to transform African narratives. Welcome, Uzo. I hope we've got Angela. I, I know we were having a bit of... Um, trouble getting her up and running. Uh, so she should be there. I'm gonna introduce her and hopefully you'll be able to see her shortly. Um, I found Angela Bruce Rayburn on Twitter actually, expressing her shock at how silent the US Institute for Peace and, and specifically its white leadership was about the recent unrest in the US. She was born in Trinidad and Tobago, but grew up in America. She's a member of a group called Black Women in Development and now works at an aid agency in Washington that supports civil society organizations around the world who advocate for public health policies. Um, and she's actually just published an op-ed uh, last week in DevEx um, calling on NGOs to move beyond hashtag activism. And I'm sure that's something we'll come back to in the discussion. Forgive me for speaking very quickly. Uh, it's my nature anyway, but I'm on even more fast forward today because we've got such, um, such a wealth of stuff to talk about. Uh, Abby Maxman is president and CEO of Oxfam America. And we reached out to Oxfam in particular because I think it is an aid agency that has prioritized more than others I've seen local humanitarian leadership. Um, Oxfam International last month actually announced that it was withdrawing from 18 countries around the world in a bid to uh, quote, fight inequalities, power and privilege in aid. So welcome Abby from New York. From Nairobi, Patrick Athara is a Kenyan political commentator, cartoonist, and media critic who looks at the role media plays in shaping the narrative, and, and that's something we personally at, at the New Humanitarian are grappling with. And if you haven't seen it already, and I'll, I'll mention it later, but you must check out his running Twitter thread on how the situation in the US would have been described if it had happened in Africa. Also in Nairobi is Degan Ali, the CEO of Edeso an NGO trying to change the way people think about and deliver aid in Africa. She has long been, as she puts it, the token black woman brought into humanitarian discussions because of her blunt views about racism in the sector. And she's been talking about that long before it became popular. Um, and uh, one example is an interview she gave last year. Um, we'll drop that in the chat as well. I'm hoping to also, you know, uh, treat this as, as a uh, curation of resources that can help inform this conversation moving forward. And both Degan and I sit on the World Economic Forum as a Global Future Council for the Humanitarian System. And lastly, joining from Geneva is Arati Krishnan, who recently led the 10-year strategy development of the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. And she basically coined a phrase that has stuck with me ever since, the changing face of vulnerability, which I think really sums up a lot of what we're talking about here today and uh, has also been central in how the Red Cross societies are thinking about their, uh, their future strategy. And Arthi is also a fellow at the Harvard Carr Center for Technology and Human Rights. Um, again, a, a piece she published this week uh, describes her vision of how the international humanitarian and development enterprise can decolonize itself. So uh, we'll drop that into the chat as well. Finally, we have an illustrator with us today, um, Ayumi Bennett, and she's going to try to sketch out live some of the conversations that we'll be having. We're gonna hopefully be able to see uh, where she's starting at and um, check in with her over the course of uh, the discussion.
So it's a, it's a blank slate for the moment, but you will see that get populated uh, as the conversation uh, unfolds and, and we'll also be able to then use it afterwards to, to share some of these thoughts with a wider audience. So uh, I promise I'll stop talking soon. A few ground rules though to cover. Um, you can use the chat to introduce yourself, to reflect on what you're hearing, but use the Q&A function to ask questions. That way we'll, we'll be able to filter them out from the rest. You can vote on other people's questions so that uh, I get a sense of which are most popular and important to answer. And if you're on Facebook, you can drop them into the comments we're moderating or monitoring as well there. I said moderating because uh, it goes without saying that uh, offensive language and um, any kind of misconduct will not be tolerated. Um, however, this isn't a candy coated event. These issues are uncomfortable. By default, we are operating in an uncomfortable zone and, and that includes for us at the New Humanitarian. Uh, we recently got a comment from, from readers or from one reader uh, essentially you know, saying the, the US is a failed state on the brink of humanitarian disaster, We're seeing massive inequality, high unemployment, COVID-19, um, in, in her words, a despot leader, militarized police state, systematically targeting black people. And she asked, is the new humanitarian planning to cover the humanitarian crisis in the US? Again, as she put it, uh, the way we do in other countries. And that prompted a real discussion internally about um, what stereotypes we are reinforcing in what we choose to cover and not cover. Um, so all that to say, this is um, equally uncomfortable for us. We don't have all the answers. We may well get things wrong, but we felt we need to start having these conversations and, and find our way. Um, last thing, I wanna recognize that uh, we can take for granted, I think, how difficult it is for black people and people of color to talk about these issues. They may make it look easy, it doesn't mean it is easy. And so I'd just like to thank you all in advance for uh, being willing to go there. All right, um, before we start talking about systems change, it's been uh, a really emotional time, I think for everyone, but in particular for uh, black people in America today, uh, pretty terrifying whirlwind really. And so I just wanted to hear from you uh, how you're feeling, what, what your mood is now. Um, Uzo, let's start with you if you don't mind. You're just on mute, though. Of course, I would be on mute. Um, <laughs> um, good morning to everyone, and, and Eva, thanks for, for having me and inviting me. And it's really nice to see all of uh, my fellow panelists. Um, I mean, I think you ask you ask like how are folks feeling, and that this is a particular ter particularly terrifying time. I mean, I would actually say that this is probably it's not. I don't know that it's any more terrifying than any other time in the United States of America. It's just that a lot more people are aware of what's going on now. I mean, I think, you know, and I've written about this before and spoken about it before. I think that if you're a black person in the United States of America, then this is something that in, in various forms to various degrees, you're exposed to on the regular and it is kind of the backdrop of your existence. So I think what's interesting is 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 a whole set of people waking up to it and realizing the terror that has been inflicted and maybe I wouldn't say coming to terms with but starting to understand their role in inflicting or constructing systems that create that terror. So how do I feel? I mean, I feel both. I mean, I think there's a general baseline anger that folks feel at injustice. Um, I think this question of of you know, you and I have talked about it, like how the new, uh, the new humanitarian covers these um, events and why perhaps the United States is a candidate for being covered in a certain way. We talked about this, I think probably a year or two years ago. Um, but I'm also hopeful in the sense that when you see the people out um, and the variety of people out in the streets protesting and this sort of, this idea of, of awareness rising, I think that says something about where society might want to go, but I don't think anybody should be under any illusions that this is going to be an easy movement forward. And I think that's where I think uh, where people need to be careful, which is to not equate the mm -hmm. outpouring energy at this very particular moment where people have been cooped up in their houses, where people are not working and have essentially then, you know, in, in many ways, nothing else to do, but go out and protest with a sustained protest movement. Um, that might sound a little bit uh, harsh, Michael? but I think the truth is these things have happened multiple times before and you haven't gotten this this kind of energy. And so you have to ask yourself, okay, so what's changed? 
And how do you take advantage of a situation that has changed to make sure that you do then have a lasting systemic change? And that's what I'll say. Candice. So thank you so much, um, Hemba, for hosting this and for everybody who um, helped put this together. And really nice to see all the panelists here. Also great to see how many people have signed up for this um, really important, um, but also tough discussion. Um, you know, I think like everybody uh, here in the United States anyway, um, I've waxed between exhaustion and, um, and being energized, right, by the last couple of weeks of activity and um, the real engagement of the public with the, the issues in front of us. Um, inequality has been, you know, kind of highlighted, obviously, by the pandemic, but uh, the recent um, police brutality issues um, have also really sharpened the dialogue on on what that inequality means on a day-to-day -day basis for so many Black Americans, Brown Americans. So, um, you know, at the same time, I have to say, you know, the exhaustion probably many times more uh, is outsized um, because it's uh, it's true that this has been part of the backdrop of everybody um, who is a person of color uh, in this country for forever, right? Uh, at the same time, um, real deal, uh, the atmospherics of the constant body blows, the daily headlines, um, the, the daily, you know, um, tweet of Damocles um, that hangs over us um, from really, I think, uh, some challenges with our leadership right now in America um, has been tough to wrestle with. And I know that it's probably been tough for a lot of people. Um, at the same time, I also think that there's, there is a great opportunity in front of us to kind of confront um, what makes the United States so fragile right now. Angela, have you managed to connect? I hope yes, you I have. have. There yes, she I'm is. Here. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, but thank you so much. And I want to say good morning as well to the panelists. Um, how, you know, your question, how are we feeling? Um, Uzo, I think you said something that I think is true. It's, it may sound harsh, but real. Um, as a mother of uh, three black children, sons, ranging between the ages of 18 to 24, I live my life in a daily state of terror. So I can, so when people talk about this moment and we say this moment as, you know, people ask me if this is a watershed moment, I don't know the answer to that. If I wake up every day and I have to monitor every single moment of the lives of my sons, when they drive their cars and they go from point A to point B, and I have to wonder if they're gonna be alive at the end of the day, I would say maybe it's not a watershed moment. So I'm one of those people that are living very much, um, I, I'm always afraid. I, as a, I'm an educated woman, I do the work that I do, but I'm always afraid. Um, I have conversations with my sons about the hoodies, the, you know, walking down the street with the AirPods, because I say, well, what if the police stop you? You can't hear. So I go through these, these mental um, anxieties that make me a crazy person on a daily basis. Um, so I am alive and I think I know that other black women with their children in this country, I know that this is what they live every day. So I'm just a part of a, um, of a you know, of, of something that's just the reality of what it is like to be a black uh, person. And um, Candace talked about our leadership in terms of having all these things happening, but knowing at the back of it is a very huge gap in leadership and the, and, and the way the discourse is unfolding. So my answer to that is simply that I'm living in a constant state of fear. That's it. <laughs> and I think that um, segues well into, I think where we, where we should start the conversation. Um, someone asked right off the top, is the US a fragile state? We've seen in uh, recent weeks since the murder of George Floyd uh, and the, the violent crackdowns on, on peaceful protesters, even targeted attacks on journalists. We've seen the International Crisis Group, uh, the Global Center for Responsibility to Protect, the Center for Civilians in Conflict, ACLED, I mean, all these groups that are used to 
condemning violence and instability abroad and whose focus is conflict zones turning to uh, the US uh, and condemning the excessive use of force, the threats of domestic military deployment, I mean, even raising um, what was called an atrocity alert, which is essentially saying the US is at risk of mass atrocity crimes. Um, we've seen UN special rapporteurs issuing statements, demanding investigations. The, the UN Human Rights Council met yesterday to discuss the US. I mean, it's just, um, it's just another world, it feels like, uh, although I, I hear all of you and saying, in fact, this has been our world for quite a while. Um, this isn't just the aftermath of George Floyd's death, I would add. You know, the US and the UK are among the countries that had the highest death tolls from COVID-19, with, of course, um, Black Americans dying at, at higher rates. But it's, uh, it's, as I said at the beginning, I think a, a wider trend. We've even seen Doctors Without Borders opening programs in Canada, Italy, Switzerland, US, et cetera. So, um, Candice, I wanted to turn to you. You, you analyze crises for a living. Um, and is the US, as our reader suggested, a failed state? Such a good question, such a hard question. Um, you know, I, I would say that the US is a, a fragile state uh, or an increasingly fragile state. Um, and that the risk of failure is highly dependent on um, how and whether American citizens, as, as well as leaders, rise to the occasion um, that we're about to face uh, in this post-election or pre-election and post-election period. Um, I think that there are some really big structural factors that um, have, are sort of embedded in the system. We know, you know that the original sin in the United States, of course, is slavery. Um, and we know that um, that has led to um, you know, extreme violence, um, state-based terrorism against um, Black people in particular, but people of color generally in this country. Um, those things are real and they have been real. What's changed? Um, why, do it, why does it look more fragile today um, you know, than it did maybe a year ago? Um, I think in large part because when you when you wake up in the morning and you read uh, headlines like unregulated militias uh, in New Mexico um, are you know acting up or um, you know there's unequal access to justice is causing unrest um, these are the kinds of things you know that we as crisis responders uh, and people who track crisis and, and complex emergencies these are the signs um, you know of uh, warning lights, essentially, red lights going off. Um, but I think the other thing that's happened um, is also, you know, 30 years ago, uh, this conversation around fragile states was in a completely different place. Uh, and in fact, the, the term fragile and fra failed states, um, you know, was quite controversial. Uh, and if you'll remember, Lakhtar Brahimi back in 1994, um, you know, this famous Brahimi report started to reflect on what are the root causes of, uh, of violence and conflict and, and how do you deal with that, uh, at least in the UN context, uh, and what does it mean? And so that's, you know, that's now 30 plus years ago. Uh, so today I think you know, there's more kind of corporate understanding or global understanding of these terms. So part of what has happened isn't so much a shift in, this, in the fundamentals um, of you know, the United States' uh, various structural inequalities, but more the lens and the frame has changed, right? Um, and we see now with much greater clarity um, what those structural flaws actually mean. And we see the cracks growing um, at a pace that we didn't see before in large part because um, the media environment has changed for sure. Uh, and, uh, and certainly uh, we have to acknowledge that the polarization that has arisen from uh, concentration of capital in this country uh, and unequal access to justice and remedy for harm, uh, you know, that has accelerated as a trend. And there doesn't seem to be any sort of stopping point, any barrier. Um, and, and everybody can see that. Uh, I, the last point I want to make, though, on this issue of, you know, fragile to failing is um, we really have to be looking at the elections um, for what they are. Um, we know that uh, the potential for disputes over the outcome from either incumbent candidate, right, the incumbent or the, the challenger, um, can really spark um, serious unrest in this country. 
And I think everybody anticipates that that will happen. Uh, you know, what this really says is that the one institution um, that the United States has kind of promoted abroad, you know, uh, elections and democracy, um, you, you know, and representative government uh, is actually at risk of failing this country. Uh, for the first time, probably since the 1960s, um, and maybe even as far back as the 1860s, we're really looking at a situation where disputed presidential election results um, are an assumption and that there's really no means and mechanism within our three, uh, three branch system of governance to deal with that kind of issue, right? Mm -hmm. um, the lack of means to de-escalate um, is really what makes the situation so fragile, uh, fragile to failing essentially. So we'll see, um, but I think, you know, uh, there are definitely conversations here in the United States amongst people uh, in the foreign policy community and national security community, uh, certainly in Washington, uh, we're keeping a close eye on this because we recognize that this is a time when, um, you know, violent suppression um, of disputes um, and unrest can really um, edge us into a long streak of deep authoritarianism. Uzo, Al Jazeera recently ran a piece saying if Black Americans were to seek asylum, they would easily qualify. Candace has just laid out a picture um, of, of things potentially getting worse. And I, uh, I, I know that's a view you share. Do you think that we could get to that stage where people are, where Black Americans are seeking asylum internationally? Uh, you know, I mean, there's also always been a long history of people, Black Americans, thinking about where else to live. Uh, because the United States has not been a friendly country to Black people. I mean, you know, you want to go back to Marcus Garvey and you think about, you know, just there have been a whole series of movements uh, like that. Do I think that you'll see um, a mass movement of Black Americans out of the United States of America? I think the first thing to, to remember is that Black Americans, African Americans are Americans, right? And I think oftentimes that's lost in the discussion that the United States is is our country, right? It is an African American country. It was built by African Americans. And I think, you know, you go back and read Baldwin or listen to Baldwin's debate at the Cambridge Union, right? And he makes that point very, very clearly and very eloquently. Um, and so I think, you you know, it's a bit of a conundrum. It's like, what do you do? And this goes, I guess, to the, to the failed fragile state discussion. What do you do in a state that is, is unable or unwilling to protect or realize your rights? Um, do you vote with your feet? You know that's one way of doing things, or do you stay in struggle and say, you know, this is my this is my country, this is my ancestors, my people have bought in. That's one, and then two, I think, you know, in that question, you sometimes you lose the the idea which um, somehow black people are not classified or qualified in this, but that like America is and has always been, you know, it's a nation of 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 great founding atrocities, and it's also a nation that is made strong by all of the immigrants, uh, immigrant labor, immigrant participation and construction of the society. Those two things, that duality is like at the core of what America is. And African Americans, Black Americans are part and parcel of that whole discussion. You know, so you have to like, you, you then ask yourself, so do you stay and you look at the positives and the strengths that, that are afforded by these populations and these populations in conversation with and interacting with each other and say, you know, we actually can turn this situation around. I, I mean, this is just the setup to say that I don't know. And I think, you know, listening to Candace's analysis and sort of laying out what, what can happen, I think it's both a, we have to wait and see. And then I think you react, you plan accordingly and react accordingly to what happens. I mean, perhaps everybody turned out in massive numbers, voter suppression doesn't work in the way that folks are looking for it to work. And you get a massive outpouring. You get the, the, the sustained protest vibe that's going on right now it leads to a sustained participation or like massive participation in, in, in the elections in November and there's no contest and then you know we see a, a change for the positive and not just say a 2008 change where everyone was really excited and energized but one that actually now makes us have to look at the structural issues that that have you know and whether it's about poverty whether it's about race whether it's like these things that are all also of course uh, connected to each other and intersect with each other then there's another conversation that we have um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I really, really want to be hopeful for the United States of America because it has been a land of opportunity for my family and for countless other people. 
And I think we shouldn't lose sight of that when we talk about the United States. But I think it would be stupid at this point in time. And I'm going to use that word like stupid because to, to not really to not be real about the crisis that we're facing and the multiple crises that we're facing. And, you know, I, I would agree with Ken, it's like the, the, the void in terms of leadership. And I don't think that's just, you know, like everybody turns to one office, but that's, I think, across the, vo the board, right? I think that what you're seeing is in a sense, we're living in a transitional period where there's a generation of in quotes leaders who have benefited and also shaped an old system that no longer applies or is no longer relevant. Um, in this current structure and the issue is like what we'll see i think again you won't see it on on friday you're not going to see it like in a year but in you know 10 years you'll begin to see who are the leaders of the new movement that makes the united states mm -hmm. or takes place and i say leaders that's both in the negative and the positive sense yeah and, you know, I'm, and I, I'm struck by you know when um you, you painted kind of a positive potential positive outcome the other outcome that you and i discussed recently is all those um, heavily armed white men who were showing up to protest in front of the House of Assemblies, what happens when black people start to get more rights in America, um, they're likely to, to go down fighting. And so the, uh, all of this is just to say that I think the threat of increased violence is, is very real and we and we internationally may well underestimate that. I, I do want to differentiate though, and sorry to cut you off, Uzo, but just to um, to jump from, from the U.S. to uh, what I think our audience is interested in, the U.S. may be a fragile state, but is it a humanitarian crisis? And does it then call on the humanitarian community to respond? Um, our audience is, in fact, largely humanitarian aid workers, so I actually am going to turn to uh, the audience to see where the finger on the pulse is on this. Um, so we should have a poll for you. And... Uh, the question is, should should the situation in the US be considered a humanitarian crisis in the way that international uh, situations of, uh, of what we've just described are? Does this demand a humanitarian response? I mean, have a, so we can't vote though? <laughs> <laughs> you get to share your view already. But I want my vote to be counted. <laughs> <laughs> you can you can make a complaint to the the administrator. No, uh, we'll see if we can change the settings to allow panelists to vote. But in the meantime, you can um, you can throw your comments into the chat. Um, I apologize for those watching on Facebook that uh, you can't access the poll. But again, you can use the chat to to share your perspectives. We are, um, as I say, treating this as a body of work over the coming months. So this is also to help inform uh, how we go about reporting these issues moving forward. While you're answering the poll, um, I want to, and we're gonna turn to Abby in a minute to, to hear whether this is considered a humanitarian response on her end. Um, I wanna turn to Patrick in, in Nairobi because you, um, you posted this amazing Twitter thread at the end of May that I referenced earlier on, on um, how the situation in the US would have been described had it, had it happened in Africa. Um, and we should have a, an image of that, um, of that thread in just a minute. But I'd love to hear from you what you were aiming to do with that. It's not the first time you've done that kind of thing. And I think quite relevant to this discussion of whether the US is in fact comparable. Uh, thanks for having me. And um, uh, I think it's great to see everybody on the panel. Um, I, I think. Uh, I mean, part of the reason why I was doing the, the thread was um, to do exactly what you said. How would this situation be um, reported if it was happening uh, outside the U.S.? Um, and I think you find that in, in when when, how, when when crisis happen in uh, places like Africa, there is particular language that is used to describe. Um, uh, 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 the crisis, the people, the places, you know. And there are particular assumptions that are there, you know, whether it's assumptions of uh, fragility, assumptions um, uh, of, 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 of impending doom, you know. Um, and I was wondering what happens if we turn that lens and we say, all right, let's apply those uh, uh, to the US. Uh, in my thread, obviously, there's uh, a bit of made up stuff uh, uh, in there. But I think in the main, it follows the uh, uh, the, the goings on in the U.S. You know, and tries to stick um, uh, as much as I can to the uh, uh, to what's actually happening on ground and to describe it uh, differently. Um, 
I, I think that the 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 way we talk about these crises, about these uh, uh, these issues, um, says a lot uh, about what it is. As uh, uh, I mean, uh, or let, let me say, it 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 makes it or it determines how we will respond to them, how we understand them. You know, and I think that to a large extent, we look at um, uh, ca certain countries as the homes of, you know, humanitarian crisis. You know, places like Somalia become synonymous with death. Uh, um, other places have, um, uh, you know, pro-democracy protests in a way you don't have them in the U.S. You know, um, and, and 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 it makes me wonder, you know, how can we? I mean, uh, what would happen if we started thinking um, uh, in, the, the, in the way you asked about the U.S. as fragile, you know, as not exceptional, but as any other country, you know, um, uh, with weaknesses that need to be resolved, even requiring help, you know, in, in some cases from African countries. Can we imagine the deployment of an African peacekeeping force to the U.S. in the way we speak about the West providing, you know, uh, uh, Whatever forces or, or or keeping the peace in other places in the world, you know, um, and I think this speaks again to um, uh, the fundamental assumption that these crises only happen in other places, you know, that they don't speak about uh, or, or they don't occur uh, 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 in the West or in the U.S. Um, uh, I, I think that that's something that we need to fundamentally undo and to fundamentally rethink. You know, um, I'll just say one other thing about language. I mean, uh, you've been talking about things like the elections in the U.S. Uh, EPC. I would say for the U.S. has had pretty rotten system, you know, uh, uh, for a long time. This this is not just um, an issue of of, of Trump. You know, um, uh, uh, I've been in forums where we discuss about um, how people uh, look at. Uh, our systems, for example, here in Kenya, and we can see that um, we, we, we can create opportunities for uh, a tyrant, a dictator to come in and ruin things, you know. Um, uh, and, and I think the U.S. for a long time had that, simply did not recognize. And now that you have somebody who's there who's taking advantage of it, is when we start now sitting back and looking. But if we had thought from before, this is a struggle that everybody has. You know, nobody has it figured out. You know, then I think um, uh, we would have uh, uh, been able to identify things from before. Um, if you think about things like elections, um, when you have situations where it's not really the person with the most votes who wins, in Kenya, that would be called a rigged election. You know, when you hear uh, things like, I mean, euphemisms like voter suppression, that is election rigging. That's what it is. But when it happens here, it is called out for that. When it happens in, in the US, it's called something else, something, I suppose, that uh, not as, as stark, you know, as, as an election being stolen. So I think the language we use really um, uh, informs whether or not, or, or even how we would approach particular questions and how we would solve them. And, and maybe kind of jumping off from that, um, it's, it's not only the language we use, but the responses we deem appropriate. And so, you know, Angela, I, I want to turn to you because uh, I remember you saying in your time as an aid worker, you know, when were NGOs ever, these NGOs that would run off to, to um, help black people in DRC, when were they ever concerned about black people in the United States of America? Can you give us a sense of how, um, how the international community has reacted to what uh, what Patrick has just laid out are, are largely equivalent situations. Right, so that's exactly the point, Patrick, is that the idea that this, and which is based, I think, on this whole white supremacy model of, or white supremacy culture, that people in the US, white people in the US, um, big organizations, people with money, wake up in the, you know, on, a, on, a, on a Monday morning and they say, we're going to go to Haiti, help poor black people. Or we're going to go to Kenya, or we're going to go to Uganda, we're going to go wherever we're going to go. And I'm thinking to myself, well, what about the poor black people in Baltimore? Um, and, I, and it was important to me to, to, to mention it because 2015, I think it was the year that Freddie Gray was killed 
in, in, in Baltimore. And there were riots in Baltimore in 2015. And I was working for, um, for Oxfam at the time. And I have to say, this is prior to Abby's, um, um, because I know Abby's on a panel, prior to Abby's tenure. But I was working for Oxfam at the time. And I remember talking to some other Black people at Oxfam and saying, it's funny how we're so, you know, we care about Haiti, we care about DRC, we care about all these places. But literally, Baltimore is 45 minutes away from our office. And we had no conversation about Freddie Gray. We had no conversation about Baltimore. We had no conversation that there were black people in the streets getting tear gassed um, and, and rubber bullets shot at them. And so it's this kind of where we, where we disconnect. And what, what Patrick is talking about makes, I, I understand it exactly, because we have this idea that when we're in the US, what is considered voter suppression, vote rigging, stealing elections in, in Kenya is completely different than what it is when it's here. And it's the same way we, we approach um, our humanitarian or ideas about people need help. Baltimore, you know, cities where there's COVID-19 ravaging the country right now. The idea that we are talking about it, but not looking at it from how can we get help from other parts of the world we wouldn't consider that because, well, it's happening here. And we don't see ourselves as being in need when we are. So that was my impression of that, that whole way of looking at how we go outside. And we're always telling people how to do things. And right here, 45 minutes away from where we are, from our, from our, our offices or, or the humanitarian work that we do, um, we don't pay attention to it. So let's see if the 900 people on the Zoom call think that you are in need, as you put it. Um, can we pull up the results of the poll? So is the US, should the US be considered a humanitarian crisis? 45 of you said yes, 20%, 45% of you said yes, 20% of you said no, 29% weren't sure, and 5% disagreed with the premise in the first place. Um, so maybe I can, with that, turn to you, Abby. Um, you know, the majority of answers were that the US is a humanitarian crisis. Angela is saying, why aren't we being treated in need? Why aren't NGOs like yours going down the street to help people? Is that beginning to change? What is, how is Oxfam navigating this moment in terms of its role in providing humanitarian response in the United States? Thanks so much, Heba. And first, let me just say how both honored and deeply hum humbled I am to be with this group. This is a time of continued deep listening, learning, and also action in a sense of urgency. Uh, and as Oxfam, as Angela rightly notes, we have had multiple moments of reckoning, and this is another one of them, in our own commitment to looking at our role, our relevance, how we show up, not just as good allies, but to be true accomplices, if you will, of really disrupting and making real change. And Heba, you said at the beginning, you know, we'll see if it lasts, the momentum, the interest, the intention. And in many ways, that as an organization like Oxfam, as me, as a white woman of extreme privilege, leading an organization that has been in humanitarian action since before aid was a term, 75 years. Uh, the responsibility to really make sure that we are part of the transformation and keeping the momentum and these very issues of systemic racism, structural inequality that is wide and deep, in the, in, in the action, in the work, far after, unfortunately, when the media attention fades, because already even, even with all that's been going on, it already is fading. I am appalled and stunned that Robert Fuller is hanging from a tree outside of Los Angeles and the headline is not about that. And that is a responsibility and a sense of responsibility that we must carry of those of us who can really do and bring accountability to what we've long been talking about of turning the humanitarian assistance 
system on its head of talking about fulfilling and honoring our commitments to local humanitarian leadership and what that really looks like, not just around the world and here in the United States. So before I, I pass on to the other incredible panelists, uh, what we are doing here in the United States uh, Angela rightly points out to the learnings, the hard learnings, the uncomfortable learnings. And frankly, if I were, if it weren't hard and uncomfortable right now, then I'm not having the right conversations and we as Oxfam are not. And we have looked, uh, we are looking at this as a human rights humanitarian crisis. We look at rights in crisis because crisis is not just the, the what, what we see on the surface of lives being lost. It is what's underneath that is causing that. And therefore we are looking, we are doing in the same way we would do elsewhere right now, uh, humanitarian assessment, talking with partners who we have a history of working with in the Gulf states, in Puerto Rico, where we also responded after Maria, I think another uh, someone on the uh, mentioned that, because the state had failed. In those cases where we've responded and have a long history of working with partners in the United States, the U.S. had, had been failing. I wouldn't call it, I, I agree with the, the discussions earlier about fragility, but we are looking and we are already supporting local partners, local action, actors, uh, social justice organizations in North Carolina, Mississippi, Puerto Rico, uh, Boston, right outside where, where we are, as you say, Angela, in our backyard. Uh, we're working in nine states at the moment in the U.S. on the social justice humanitarian agenda that COVID has unveiled all of the things and the deep inequalities that we know have long been there. And we have a responsibility to keep the attention on it even after the media attention fades. And that's something I want to come back to because there, there was a, a question um, that we received in the chat, in fact, from, uh, I hope I don't mispronounce your name, Kirti, um, how can we make sure we keep these conversations going beyond this current moment? But hopefully um, we can kind of end on that as a way, as a way forward. Um, and I think you have answered another question that came in from, again, I'm likely to mispronounce the sign, I think, saying, does Black Lives Matter mean that we now also mentally drop the idea that humanitarian aid is only needed overseas? Um, which, you know, Abby, you've just said, yes, you do think the, the U.S. Uh, constitutes a, a crisis worthy of a humanitarian response. So that's already, I think, um, a place that we, we weren't uh, even a few months ago. Um, Dagan, I want to turn to you because, you know, Abby just described this as a moment of reckoning, and yet a lot of the stuff that we are talking about in terms of the, the flaws of international aid, uh, and we'll come to that, I think, in a, in, a, in a bit more detail in a second, that's stuff we've been talking about for a really long time, or more accurately, that's stuff Black people have been talking about for a really long time and not being heard. Um, and so I, and, and particularly did in the... Um, and I think uh, Dagan's connection is not super strong. So if, if we struggle, that's why, um, you know, you've been advocating uh, for the role of local people in humanitarian response. You've been banging the drum about racism and aid for a long time. Is it a relief or a frustration that people are now finally listening? Um, it's ironic that when we say it, it's controversial. When white people write about it, they're applauded for it. Um, so um, I, I think uh, it's, it's a positive thing that we're having this conversation, but I also worry that it's becoming the trendy thing. Everybody is saying that they're supporting the Black Lives Matter movement, but at the same time, I don't see uh, people having these really important conversations about the structure, the architecture of the aid system and how it's been designed in, um, on purpose to ensure inequities and to ensure that we don't get out of poverty. And uh, this is part of the neo-colonial imperialistic uh, design. And so, um, and we don't talk about, um, and I think this is part of um, this apoliticization of aid. It's been designed, the humanitarian system, to be purposefully apolitical and with these humanitarian principles as the backbone of it. So um, where we are asked to be neutral in a crisis uh, while we watch people die and while we are not um, 
felt feeling a sense of responsibility to save lives uh, if that means taking arms on behalf of saving lives and um, i'm writing uh, an article and one of the points i make is is that um if i was an aid worker in rwanda i would be asked to just observe the genocide and negotiate access um, rather than saying how do i save people's lives um so there is a it's particularly designed to be apolitical when we are talking about extremely political situations and issues. Um, and I'm just worried that uh, it's becoming a hip, uh, trendy thing. Uh, people, white people taking pictures um, of themselves with uh, signs and uh, at events. And uh, I, I, I just, uh, I'm worried that we just move on and we don't use this opportunity to have a serious reckoning about the structural uh, issues that have created uh, uh, the situation that we're in now. There's a question that we received from Samantha, um, which is, where are you seeing the conversations around revisiting the colonial legacy and perpetuation of the legacy in aid right now? And where are we not yet seeing those conversations? To your mind again. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? You talked about we're not really having the conversation about the structural problems in international aid. Are you seeing that conversation happening in certain circles or, or just not at all? Not at all. It's not happening at all. Um, people are talking about um, localization, local leadership. Um, we, we don't need localization, frankly. What we need, which is, in my opinion, a very pejorative term, what we need is uh, a ra radical reckoning to understand why Africa is still in the situation it is, why we are in debt to these Bretton Woods institution, why we have v uh, veto power for certain countries in the UN Security Council, where we cannot resolve the Syria crisis for seven years and we have an impasse. We need to understand why the DRC has been ignored because of the looting and the plundering of multinational companies that are extracting natural resources. I mean, these are the, the result of the humanitarian crisis. These are structural issues. These are simply not uh, a, a tweet or a video. These are more than that. And that those structural issues, when I talk about UN Security Council reform four years ago at the WHS and the World Humanitarian Summit, um, people really thought I was an alien, like I was crazy. How, could, how dare you question the UN system? And so, um, and now still it's radical to talk about racism and it's a year ago, but now it's hot and it's hip and it's trendy. So, but let's move to the next level. Okay, we're making progress. A year ago, racism was a very taboo subject. Now we're getting there. But now let's use this momentous occasion, this historical crossroads that we're at to say, why is it that young people have the courage to go out in the streets and protest, and we as civil society are still negotiating about 25% grand bargain commitments? Money is not the answer to this problem. It's not an issue of money. This is an issue of structures and uh, serious inequalities that have been designed to keep us in these situations of poverty, that have been designed to ensure that we don't have a voice, that have been designed to ensure that we're invisible, that have been designed to, be in, to ensure that we don't have the power to, to make our own language. We are told you are localizing. We're not told about we, we want equity, we want justice. It's, it's the language, who has the power to design this language? So all of these things, uh, the, what Gathara was talking about, uh, who's writing the narrative about the U.S. and who's writing the narrative about Somalia as a fragile state? You know, so these, we, these are the structural issues that we need to be talking about. We need to go beyond hashtags of Black Lives Matter. May I very just quickly... Uh, Please, about, Patrick, uh, because in fact it was you who, who was mentioning to me that, you know, we look at the U.S. and we see the systemic problems that underpin the racism, but we look at the international structures and we don't see that there's also a systemic system that's underpinning why some rich countries stay rich and poor countries stay poor. So please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I just make two quick points. Um, uh, first, uh, we have to think also about the imagery that when used alongside the language 
So what does a humanitarian crisis look like? What does a victim of a humanitarian crisis look like? In many cases, it is a black, African, emaciated somewhere, which makes it hard for people to think about the other aspects of a humanitarian crisis that might uh, be occurring. So in places like the US, where you might not have you know, uh, uh, people who are starving, and then there's the idea that, oh, well, no, that's not a crisis there, you know. So the image that is used, think of uh, COVID-19 um, uh, and the pictures that come out of COVID-19 and the pictures that came out of uh, uh, Ebola in, in 2014, you know. In one place, there's really graphic, really horrendous photographs coming out. In another, it's much more sanitized, you know. And this is just speaks to how we, uh, which lives I think are privileged, are respected, or which are the narratives that we are giving about where is precarity in this world, that it does not exist in the West, does not exist in particular places. It only exists and is constrained we, uh, at what is called the developing world. And uh, I'll speak later on about that, the whole idea of development, which are big, big problems with. Um, when it comes to the, the Black Lives Matter uh, uh, issue, there's an idea that um, within the US that uh, uh, the sort of uh, the, the, the Black population is uh, a victim of structural injustice, you know. Um, and I think there's a lot of uh, coming around to that uh, uh, idea. And I think it's a big pillar of what uh, uh, BLM is pushing for is the recognition that this is not individual failing. You know, when you see people, uh, I mean, the, that they're not, uh, or, uh, uh, that, that their lifestyles are, are, are depressed and not making as much money ATC. But my question is, what happens in the, on the international stage? When things happen in Africa, you hear the blame is hipped on the Africans, you know, that, uh, oh, it's they're just corrupt guys. They're just um, uh, uh, lazy people, you know, ETC. It's always about how people are not, or they have bad leadership, you know. There's very little discussion about the uh, uh, structural problems that uh, um, uh, were being uh, mentioned before. You know, that there is an actual system that is keeping the African, quote unquote, in his place, you know, that is depriving us of our resources. I mean, I mean uh, uh, to give a few uh, statistics, um, uh, for every dollar that Africa gets in aid, half goes away, goes out, leaves the continent on the same year. And actually, Africa is a net creditor to the rest of the uh, uh, of the world. Um, uh, I think there was a study that was done that looked at uh, 39 countries and was saying that um, uh, in the period that, uh, uh, in the 40 years between 1970 and uh, 2010, it gave out four times what the actual debt of those countries are. You know, it, about 1.3 trillion uh, uh, dollars was taken out of the country, uh, of, of those 39 countries. So it is a system of extraction but then it is portrayed very differently. It is portrayed as, oh, these are poor people, not that these are people who are impoverished. And they are impoverished not by their own uh, uh, doing, but by a system that is designed to essentially extract resource from them and feed it up to uh, uh, the international, uh, I mean, to, 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 uh, to the West in essence. And, if and, you and look, Patrick, just to, just to tie that back to the aid sector, what, where do you see its role in that system that you say is keeping Africa poor and keeping it in need of aid? Well, I think the, one of the problems with the aid system and the, or the humanitarian system is that it provides a solve for these things. It, 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 uh, it perpetuates the, this idea that if we just fix the immediate um, uh, emergencies, then we don't have to speak about the structural problems. You know, so we keep uh, or maintain countries in this situation of precariousness, you know, for years. So you keep talking about chronic crisis, but it is implied that the, 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 the weakness is within the country or that let's build resilience. So people learn to cope with a, a system that really should not exist. We shouldn't be building resilience. We should be removing the reason why we are saying they need resilience. You know, but that's not what we talk about. 
And this is what I think for me uh, becomes the, the problem with the whole uh, structure of humanitarian uh, aid or the whole aim. What are we trying to achieve? Are we trying to fix the immediate problem? Yes, we've got somebody starving. Or are we trying to say that we should never have people starve? You know, and I think in as much as humanitarians tend to say we are only dealing with the emergency, then they, they become part of the system that perpetuates um, uh, uh, the, 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 the chronic problems and this uh, uh, situation of precariousness. Um, Heba, can I just comment on that, please? Because I, 100%. Um, one of the things I see as an aid person, especially a person who worked in Haiti after the earthquake, and I wrote about this recently, just saying, I wonder how many people we can ask today who were participating in the whole Haiti post-earthquake recovery, who would say to you today that all the money that supposedly was um, all allocated across, the, you know, from the U.S. and all these other places, if it really turned out to be anything other than a, a, a Band-Aid on a, on a gunshot wound, so to speak. Um, it was a... And I think that you would probably find very few people who would think that all of what happened in Haiti after the earthquake was anything other than the humanitarian community, the international community getting together to talk about how much they're going to give. And of course, we all know that what they say they're going to give don't exactly turn out to be what they give because we have a system where, you know, the president could say we're going to give this much money, but then Congress has to appropriate and allocate. And if that does not happen, we don't get the money. So it was this entire huge structure, this big apparatus that went into Haiti in 2010 after the earthquake that today, if you were to look at what has happened in that country, you will find that the, the, the major NGOs, Oxfam included, have to look back at this and say, we, we failed in so many ways in that country. And, and, and one more thing, just to talk about, you know, the structures and all the things that go on behind. When we talk about Africa, or even when we talk about Black people in the U.S., we talk about them and we say, um, if Black people in the U.S. are low income, we'll, we'll, we'll say they're lazy. But if we talk about white people who are low income, we'll say poor. If we talk about white people who are on the welfare system, they're, um, they're just down on their luck at this time. Black people who are on the welfare system are generationally on the welfare system. So we, so, so the idea about these people in America, as well as in Africa who are, you know, or, or any part of the world where we have development aid, creates this idea that these people are poor because of bad choices, because their governments are poor. Um, they're poor because, um, you know, they're lazy. Uh, the women, you know, have a ton of children be, um, because they don't understand birth control. I mean, it's a whole mindset that when you dig deeper and you look at and what Diggin is saying, you realize that we are here in Africa because of racism, colonialism, the leg legacy of slavery, and how Western countries underdeveloped Africa. And, and there's a famous book by a, a, a Caribbean person, and I want to mention it because I'm from the Caribbean. Sir Walter Rodney wrote a book called How Europe um, Underdeveloped Africa. And if you want to talk about the structure of why we're here today, go back and look at that book and read about what these countries have done to African countries, what they've done to the Caribbean, what they've done to, to Latin American countries that now we're poor and we're always in need and we're always begging. And that is where we need to start at that level. That's what I want one, to add. one thing you said to me that, yeah, Uzo, go ahead. Um, and just to piggyback off of uh, a couple of things and make a few quick points, but to, to one, uh, agree in totality with a lot of what has been said by Angela and by Dagon and Patrick. Um, I think first, I wanted to just go back to something when we talk about Black Lives Matter and we talk about the humanitarian sector, I think people forget the debt that uh, the humanitarian sector owes to African-Americans in the civil rights movement. I think a lot of forms of protests that, that have been effective and that, that people see, whether it's nonviolent protests or political, political action or whatnot, do owe a lot to what was done here in the 60s and led by a lot of Black leaders here in this country. And so I think that's one thing just to put out there. Another thing that I think um, I just want to make the point about is that you know, I, I think that folks who work in the humanitarian sector 
often, uh, I don't know if it's forget or, or willfully, uh, I'm trying to use my words carefully here, but I think. It's not like you, Uzo. This, <laughs> this idea that, that the aid sector is divorced from like actual foreign policy and power politics is something that I've never really understood. I think Especially just when make, you have Boris Johnson just yesterday right. specifically saying that, that he's merging the two departments for missionary zeal exactly. of the UK. That, that it's going to be now absorbed into the foreign office and people were up in arms and I was like, but why is that confusing to people? Like DFID has always been an arm of British foreign policy and therefore an extension of what the state itself wants to achieve in the world. And sometimes those values or those like those objectives align with certain folks in certain countries. Oftentimes they're not in alignment. So that's some, something to, to keep in mind. But to then think about it, right? And I think this goes back to what folks have been saying in terms of the structure. Um, and I mentioned this to you, Hiba, is, you know, I was just reading Ali Mazuri, actually, Patrick, who's a, who's a one-time compatriot of, of yours, uh, the former, the, the now deceased Kenyan professor and novelist, who writes about this idea of technology transfer and transfer of wealth, right? So this idea that we don't approach aid, and this is what I said in that speech, which Heba, you said was, was uh, it didn't go over well. I thought it went over pretty well. I said, well, oh, I, I loved it, but I'm not sure that, uh, <laughs> you but, know, the Swiss audience was a bit shocked by it. Uh, you have to start from first principles, which is, in my mind, which is first of all, looking at just the philosophy that underpins like the creation of the state and also who's considered human. And I think all of the folks, all the, the, the sector itself is based off of liberal values that have from the very get-go excluded or thought of black people as existing outside of the realm of what it means to be human. That's number one. Number two, that whole period and up until now, we forget that the greatest mass transfer of wealth to ever happen in the history of humans happened during like under like in to create essentially the liberal states that we we now consider the the sort of the, the distributors of aid the number that i think is important for people to think about and we can talk about it within the context of the united states there was a study and i mentioned this in the speech but a study that came out maybe it was it was probably about 10 years ago now that talked about conservatively if you wanted to account for the total value of labor that and this is just labor right that that uh enslaved folks in the United States contributed to the economy, it equates to about $16 trillion. This is a conservative calculation. If you look at number of hours worked, like number of people and like giving a minimum wage, okay? Think about that. So now you're, you're talking about a $16 trillion gap to start off with. That's an insurmountable gap. Ask Europe or ask $16 trillion is the GDP of Europe. The United States is about $21 trillion. Now ask someone to transfer $21 trillion that amount of money doesn't actually exist in the world, right? And that's the gap that we're talking about to start off with. And that's important to realize when you think about what it means to give aid. I, I think Patrick, you mentioned this idea of like the, the, the outflows dwarf the inflows. It's very, very true. But the truth is when we talk about this, and this is again why I go back to, you have to think about aid really within the context of power projection is you, you are, it's like, what are the objectives of the countries that are distributing this money and like if if there were really sort of an altruistic objective then you know i'd be able to get up and you know like we'd all be able to get up and say okay so here is your bill for conservatively 21 trillion but with interest let's call it you know however much compounded and you know like then we can start having this discussion and then after that if we are still not able to build systems that work then you can say okay maybe you have a problem maybe you guys don't know what you're doing or maybe you don't know what you're talking about but until that happens there's no that, that it's just it's a non-starter of a discussion and then lastly i would think that you know like one has to think about again um you know the 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 idea of narrative and i i, I love that folks have been talking about narrative um in this in this discussion which is like you the context matters so so much in this and i think you know again it's hard for people to 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 change the con or to think about context or change context because it does violence to your person. If you have ordered your worldview for in such a way for so long that you, you're not even aware of the way that you've ordered your worldview, right? You know, let's think about this. I was just reading an article the other day. If you look at the World Bank, for example, and I, I say this as a child of somebody who worked at the World Bank for most of her career, but like if you look at the World Bank, how many people, how many black people, how many Africans are actually in senior leadership positions that are not in the Africa region? 
right? Number one, if you look at all of these other international organizations, and I get this a lot, and I'm sure other folks uh, who are black on this call get this a lot, you know, like, how can we make sure that we're, we're, we're like more diverse in our staffs? You know, I don't really know how to answer that question because the answer is so simple, like hire black people, hire people from the country. The <laughs> second part about that is, is something that has, I can tell you personally, which is here, like I, I can command a certain salary as somebody from the United States, right? Just, and this actually happened to me. I went to work for people that I had worked for as an intern in the United States. I was living in Nigeria. And when it came time to negotiate my salary, guess what? All of a sudden, like all of the wonderful degrees from fancy US institutions that I had suddenly didn't account for anything. And it was just, oh, I'm a black person with an African name. And therefore on the rank of input and on the rank of, of value, that just changed completely. And so how do you expect to have a sector that's effective when even in its own structures, it doesn't value the contributions or like any, the contributions or the lives of the people that it's supposed to supposedly help. I mean, and if there's no better indication of what you actually value than where you put your money. And if you're not putting your money, the, the right amount of money into these things, then you know, we're not really having a discussion. That's all I wanted to say. So I'm gonna jump in because I promised uh myself that we would leave this conversation slightly constructively because it's um, really easy, although I don't think uh, that's not to say that what we've just discussed has been, um, as, as Degan said, the, the dominant narrative, but it's easy and there are a lot of people who do complain about the sector. What's really hard is how do you fix it? And, um, and, and just to kind of try to tie all of this together, because I, I think we're talking about a bunch of different things that are related, but conceptually quite hard to intertwine sometimes. I think what COVID and, and Black Lives Matter have done is, is uh, identify or expose some of those weaknesses in the system because they put into question the credibility of aid organizations that are working overseas, but not working at home. Because they're putting into question this idea that we're, as Dan said, gonna be apolitical, but actually when social justice is the problem we don't touch that because um, we're neutral and impartial um, and so all of these questions that have as i as i said earlier been um, asked over and over for years are now are becoming more obvious and more exposed um, and yet all of these years of talking about them haven't really resulted in an alternative vision for what humanitarianism can look like in the modern era in a way that isn't toxic that isn't neocolonial um, i'm going to throw another poll at you guys and since this is the new humanitarian and we don't let anyone get off easy. It's uh, a rather heavy one. But um, I guess the question is, is internationalism necessarily fraught? Like, is this, should we just burn it down? Or uh, is there a way out of this that can challenge those kind of structural, um, structural underpinnings of the neocolonialism that you have all just outlined? Um, and I want to turn while you're answering the poll to Arati um, for uh, you've been listening quietly all this time, but from a kind of structural perspective, how does how does change happen? Is change even possible? Uh, thanks, Heather. And uh, yeah, again, a quick a quick um, thank you to everybody for your amazing views. And it's, it's lovely to be on this panel. Um, so I want to just maybe reflect on a couple of things uh, very quickly, very, very quickly of, of what's been said and in full agreement. I, the, the, we've been talking about this for a very, 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 very long time, right? And Patrick and Dagan and Angela, you all hit the nail on the head. We look at humanitarianism as a band-aid solution rather than looking at the interconnected risks and the interconnected structural and systemic issues of why those risks and that crisis happens in the first place. We say phrases like leave no one behind as if it's an accidental thing that happens after a crisis, not because it's actually a structured design of injustice in the first place. Um, the uprising around racism is, is on the back of, as you've said, Heba, we had this around sexism and, and sex, sexual harassment. None of us in all the institutions that we worked in, and again, we can honestly say this and bring our truth to it, have escaped, uns have escaped unscathed from that. And yet, have we forgotten that story? One of the things we, when we talk about reimagining, we, again, so there's a couple of things that I want, I want to put forward here. 
There's so many of us that are talking about futures of humanitarian aid, futures of development, et cetera, but whose vision are we privileging in that reimagination? Who gets to be around that decision-making table? Who gets to be part of those discussions, right? And it's the same thing with Degan. Degan and I would agree 150% on localization. We talked about localization, but localization is one of the pillars is around investments. And who's around that decision-making table when you're making decisions around where your money gets invested? It's not people from, from, from where, who are receiving that money. So we, have, we, have a, we need a reimagination of ideology. The print humanitarian principles are not fit for our future. I, I've raised this for a couple of years now, and I keep, it's a controversial topic, and I keep getting yelled at, but I will keep saying it. Our ideas of what neutrality or, or even the UN Charter or human rights, we have a romanticized myth of, of remembering it, and we forget the, the, the injustices in which it was raised and how we kept reimagine that for the, for the future. The other point is also in who we bring in. Our, we're institutions made up of people and our idea of being an aid worker is caught up in the idea of I. So can we change the notion of, of why it is that we're doing the work that we do? Can we move from a charity lens, which has underpinned how we think about aid and development to one of justice and social equity? That's a fundamental thing. And unless we're thinking about not just issues of racism, because I would argue that class and issues of classism are also permeate the aid industry. And I would argue that as a person of color that you know is Malaysian, Australian, um, and I've seen my fellow black brothers and sisters and people of color brothers and sisters um, perpetuate the same injustices and inequality based on caste and class and which, which strata of society you come from. Um, so how does change happen? And Fundamentally, we need to recognize that change doesn't come from just the top and change doesn't come just from the bottom. We have to find a way in which we bring it together. And we bring it together when we can leverage the anger and the hurt and the grief and the healing and the solidarity that we need to happen. And we use the levers that are coming out, right? The levers that expose institutions and systems where it hurts and where there's opportunities. And those levers are reputation. Those real levers are financing. Those levers are leadership and structure. And those levers are also, um, yeah, actually th those three are the things that I would say. And how do we leverage this to ensure that we're not just as Degan said, this will happen and then we'll forget about it, but how can we understand the political underpinnings of how institutions actually change? Because heaven forbid, we are a billion trillion dollar industry that's invested into ourselves and we're not going to change just for the sake of it. And I, I'm using the word we because we are all complicit in this sector together, even as people of color, even as black people, we are all in this in, in somehow. Um, structure, ideology, who gets to do that reimagination? How do we tie that in to the levers that will actually enable change to happen? And I want to say this last thing too, if, if, if I might. Um, we never talk about how we can gracefully get things to end. We design policy, we design programs, we were there for 50 years. That's not something to be proud of, I'm sorry. It's not something to be proud of. You know, we've been cap capacity building for whose capacity, for what purpose? And, and shame on us, shame on all of us because poor people are still poor. Shame on us. So the one thing I just want to end there, when we're doing our reimagination, when we're doing about a re revisioning of what this humanitarian aid system or development system can look like, let's also include in there, how can we gracefully end the things that are just not working anymore so that other things can flourish? How can we enable ourselves to go beyond resilience and survival as if that's the only thing that as human beings we are allowed to have but to collective thriving and flourishing. And to go to collective thriving and flourishing, we need to understand interconnected systemic and structural complexity issues. And, and until we do that, we are just skimming the surface of mediocrity. And I'm, yeah, we're being mediocre. While I, mm -hmm. on that, on that uh, note, while I get the poll results up on screen, um, I wanna pick up on, uh, on what I think is essentially your point that for change to happen, um, it, it's not a bunch of angry people that's gonna lead to that, but it is 
uh, a deep understanding of what it is that will allow those who have power to let it go. Um, where, so is that, is that possible? You all said um, international aid is inherently fraught because it cannot be divorced from its neocolonialist roots, 31%. Uh, but actually 44% of you said, uh, no, it's not inherently problematic. It can be reimagined in a way that isn't toxic. Um, Dagan, I want to turn to you. You, you were, uh, before this call, you sent me this, this video of Arundhati Roy, who, who reinforced what much of you have said, um, many of you have said over the course of this call, that charity keeps the structure in place. She said, we are ruled by men that are long dead. What we want, we will have to seize or go down fighting. And I have sensed this mood of revolution among quite a number of um, Black internationalists since all of this unfolded, is change possible? I think change is possible, but I think first it has to start with our own, recognizing our own complicity in the structure. And um, this is where um, the, 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 the phrase, you know, money is the root of all evils. Um, when you're an NGO and your metrics of success as the CEO or as the board chair is getting more and more money and planting your flag in more and more countries, then you are no longer civil society. You are a business. And, um, and that's, what, that's the trap we in the global south have fallen to and we need to unshackle ourselves from this idea that if we get more money, somehow we're gonna resolve the problems for, of our people and we're not. And once we do that and we realize and take this, the stage as real civil society, um, then that means that we might have the opportunity to create solidarity for the global north and global south and do what these courageous young people are doing and start making demands on the system saying, we want you on Security Council reform. We want you, the G77, our national governments, to, start, to stop taking IMF and World Bank loans. We want you to recognize how these institutions are not helping. Um, these, these, I don't see how the power is not going to be relinquished uh, by, uh, without a demand. And we are too busy running after money to make that demand. And uh, how do we stop recognizing money as the center of our universe and start recognizing uh, social justice and our role as real civil society is what should be driving us. And that I think is one of the biggest problems is our complicity both, uh, both as Northern NGOs and Global South NGOs. Um, here there, in Kenya, there was um, the first child or the first victim of police brutality after the lockdowns was a 12 year old uh, boy in Isli. And, um, and there have been about 27, almost 30 victims of police violence who have died since the lockdowns. Uh, and people were out in the street and who were those organized? It was organized by small social justice organizations uh, from Madare and Kibera. The slums, they weren't organized by the professional uh, Kenyan NGOs, including myself, you know. We are too busy living this comfortable life and doing armchair activism. This so, is a so, problem. And so I, I, I don't see how we can address serious structural issues without recognizing that. Go ahead. Let me ask you this, Degan, because it, it's come up a few times in several questions. How do you then de-link the international aid structure from that funding? How would you suggest that humanitarian action wean itself off from Western government funding? Another question was how might we force major international NGOs to begin defunding and working with donors to shift the aid delivery to local actors? So what is the lever for changing that financing equation? <clears throat> well, I think for me, that's why I started off what I just said because I don't see how we're gonna get UN Security Council reform. I don't see how we're gonna get uh, Bretton Woods reform or defunding of the Bretton Woods institutions. And that's what we should be aspiring to. Just like defunding the police, we need to recognize these institutions need to be defunded until we act as proper civil society. So I think that 
we need a movement of international civil society that is really about solidarity. And we need to be very clear and organized and we need to start thinking about how we get resources. The Black Lives Matter movement has taken 10 years to get to where it was. It was a disparate people-based movement 10 years ago. Now they're very coordinated, organized, uh, uh, sophisticated organizations that know how to capture the moment and know how to organize and how to coordinate their efforts. And, so, and uh, for us in uh, a civil society in the global south, we're just busy surviving and keeping our lights on. We don't have the ability to breathe, let alone to organize and, uh, a street protest and think about other things beyond. But, but that's because we have been complicit in putting ourselves in these little boxes of projectizing and counting rather than shouting. And so, uh, so for me, I think it's about really, uh, I don't see how these institutions of power will really change without us as civil society taking the role of drivers of that change. I just want to jump in here and just say something about money and power, um, which we keep coming back to, right? Um, real deal, money changes some things, but not all things. Power changes everything. And, you know, we've seen from organizations, um, you, you know, USIP, ICG, Civic, uh, all, you know, IRC, all, lots of organizations come out with solidarity statements. I want you to go to their websites right now. And, and look and see how many are asking for volunteer interns to work in their offices, okay? <laughs> Go ahead, look at it right now, because I'll tell you something, that shows where their real commitment lies. All talk, no play. If you really wanna change the dynamic, as Arathi was saying, we have to be thinking about what is the pipeline for leadership in these organizations in this sector? Okay, what are the barriers for leadership uh, in, in, this, in these organizations and in this sector? But Dagan points out something even more important. Once we arrive, okay, um, it's time to take a sledgehammer entirely to the IMF, entirely to the World Bank, entirely to this structure of the UN Security Council uh, that we've been living with for 70 years. It's not good enough. Uh, the priority has to be uh, for leaders of all stripes, but definitely for leaders of color to start speaking up, speaking out about these barriers that are in front of us, in front of the people who are behind us, and our willingness to work to put the sledgehammer to the foundation of this inequality. Um, if I may. I may I, just Sorry, could I maybe just... Um... I'm, I'm just going to, before you all jump in, which I think you should, I'm just going to note, it's 5 p.m. in Geneva. Uh, we were meant to end now. I knew it, we would never make it to the end on time. So for those who, uh, most of you are still on the call, for those who'd like to stick around, um, I think we can carry on for a few more minutes. For those who need to drop off, of course, we understand. Uh, because I would like to just hear a last round from everyone on kind of what is that reimagined way of working. Uh, there were a lot of questions around what are some immediate steps that can be taken that would open up this door to more significant change? And I do wanna to try to get a bit more of that. We started getting to that answer now. So uh, I hope everyone will excuse us for running a few minutes over. Arthi, go ahead. Um, thank you, and Candice, Degan, um, um, for, for raising some really good points. So I just wanna, I wanted to come on a couple of things. I talked about classism earlier, um, and it's related to that point around leadership and the leadership pipeline, right? Who we hire in international organizations and aid organizations, we hire people that are fit, that fit the tribe. You know, you're part of the gang. We actually make it. You know, we, we talk so often about how hard it is to get into the sector because in our bid to professionalize, we've actually just narrowed the pool to an echo chamber of people that are that all look the same, feel the same, despite of whatever differences, right? And it. It's designed to eliminate voices and people um, and experiences that cannot have that same types of access, right? Um, if you don't go and get your master's in whatever, whatever, and you didn't get your, couldn't afford to do your internship, how do you get a foot in the door? You can't. So we keep hiring, training, and then moving people around the system um, in a very comfortable way that are the same echo chamber. 
look at, I want to look at these people's organizations, websites, who do they have in their leadership teams? How many of them are at senior leadership positions are in C-suite positions versus middle management or just in the local office? Like, let's be very, very real about that, how we hire. We also talk about change. You know, institutions are saying, we've got to change our services, blah, 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 we'll respond to, but everything is the exogenous change outside of the institution, how, we, how they will change to serve others, sorry, how they will change their service delivery to serve others, beneficiaries, we're still using that term, like, but rather than how, we're, how the institution itself needs to take change inside, not just about what it does, but how does it, how does it, how it works, how it relates to each other. And it isn't about, I think the last thing I just want to say here is the structure of the future is a network structure, but we have to learn how to work in a network, in a true network of nodes where we are, where civil society is still treated as the poor cousin. Why is that? Um, and how do we work in network nodes that have equity and flattened decision-making in that I can't solve that on my own, but we need, we need brains coming together to think about that. And how do we just, just get rid of this ideology that I have to go there and save them and, and, and I don't have to do anything about myself to change, you know? Um, I, I, so I, I want to, I want to, I want to um, wager that we've started answering that question in a few ways. You know, you've talked about, um, the leadership and hiring pipeline and who is represented in these organizations. We've talked about the shift towards uh, more of an activist kind of social justice rather than charity model. Dagan talked about that too. Talked about defunding um, or, or moving away from this dependency on, on Western funding, which then shapes uh, everything that follows. I'm going to throw um, Another question up there, because I know a lot of people in the audience uh, are also going to be trying to answer this question and trying to, as I say, reimagine the alternative model. So while we do that round of, of kind of final ideas around what the answers are to, to that question that you've just posed, Arati, um, maybe the audience can also pitch in with some of their ideas because uh, we we have a lot of um, a lot of our audience tends to be quite quite smart and quite. Um, specialized in this sector as well. So if we can throw up um, the instructions, basically you're gonna have to go to menti.com, punch in the code you see on the screen. And as, as everyone's giving their kind of final thoughts on what is that model of reimagined aid or how do you decolonize it, um, I'd encourage you all to do the same. Patrick, I think you were gonna jump in. Um, yes, thanks. Uh, what I was going to say is um, I, I like what Candace said about taking the sledgehammer. And, and, and I think mm -hmm. for me, it's like we, we've got to be more ambitious. You know, I think that's one of the big things that I take out of uh, Black Lives Matter is ambition. Is I mean, mm -hmm. who'd have thought when they started that we'd be talking about defunding police, you know, that actual towns are doing, you know. Um, and, and I think rather than sort of trying to entrepreneur within rubbish systems, is actually taking that sledgehammer to the world system. You know, we, if we look at a place like the US and we say that it is unacceptable and is unsustainable to have a situation where you've got one proportion of the population, one part of the population living um, uh, uh, at a particular level and the others sort of being uh, uh, an underclass, then we can take that same logic to the international community and say it is not sustainable, it is not desirable. It is actually, I think, uh, uh, um, horrible that we've got a situation where a small proportion of people, especially in Western countries, you know, um, uh, white Western countries, you know, um, uh, live off the, the work and the labor and the resources of an underclass, you know, made up of people of uh, 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 black people and four colors of four color, you know, that we say that is not acceptable. And if we start with that premise, that that cannot be allowed, it's not an issue then of us saying, uh, we, we need to fix something uh, uh, within Africa. The problem lies in the people who constructed the world we live in today. And it's the onus is on them to fix it. And we've got to insist that it is fixed and to put in the pressure on them to actually come up with the resources to do it. You know, we, we can 
put in ideas, and I'm, what I'm saying is, uh, it's, it's, let's be ambitious in discussing this. When you talk about security, I mean, uh, UN Security Council reform should not be, uh, uh, in fact, for me, that's kind of, uh, 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 what's the word? It's not going the whole hog, you know. Why do we need the UN Security Council? Why do we need the UN? You know, and can we construct a world where we all agree that this is what it should look like? You know, rather than saying we're kind of stuck with this uh, system and um, let's just find ways of thriving within it. Uh, that for me is what I would want us to completely reject and to think that we can reimagine the world and you in a way that works for pretty much everybody who lives here. Uh, I'm going to turn to Uzo and right. Angela in, in just a minute for closing thoughts, but uh, Candace, I'll note that your sledgehammer made it onto the wall of ideas. I guess my, my, my challenge or what I'm struggling with is what does that mean? How do you take a sledgehammer to the IMF? Like, are we in La La Land to be saying, as Patrick says, we're going to, you know, resist this and we're going to create a narrative, a world that works for everyone. Um, so I want to, before I come to you guys for closing, Abby, um, from someone who is in one of these uh, institutions that we're now talking about transforming um, and uh, in the polite uh, in the polite language and burning to the ground in the less polite language, um, what of this is realistic? Like, is any of this even imaginable? And you guys have already shifted. You used to have a pretty much uh, old white man leadership. It's much more diverse today. That's a sign of something, but we're talking about a whole other level of, of um, restarting that just feels um, out of reach. Well, thanks, Heba. And really, this has been so enriching in every single way, a great dialogue. And again, honored to be part of this. I think uh, for us, it is actually about action. It's not about talking anymore. It's about making the change. Um, and we, we break it down into many different ways, but I'll just summarize, and I think it uh, aligns with what others have said. Leadership and governance, what does that mean in our own entities? And I, we've been very intentional in Oxfam America of, of transforming at the highest levels and throughout the organization, who we hire, what we look like, who, whose voices are we hearing and why, and whose aren't we hearing, and how do we work on second culture? And that's huge and critical, and it's a priority we have lifted up. And I'm not saying it's enough, and I know I'll be enriched by, by the conversation today. And then the external, the policy program practice. We have closed, we've committed to closing out of 18 countries and transforming how we work in the remaining 70 around the world and looking at our responsibility to what that really looks like. Some places we've been since 1961, if we don't make the change, the change isn't gonna happen. We've been deeply committed to some of the things that are, I understand the panelists and others don't agree with local humanitarian leadership, but we talk it and we are committed to seeing it through and making these changes in action. And our public and community engagement, how do we connect and, and look to lift up the voices of others to partner better, to partner differently. We've spent the past two years listening to hundreds of partners who are saying, be accountable to your commitments and we're going to be driving that forward. I got a lot of condolences when we announced the closing out of 18 countries. Well, I don't want the condolences. I want us to take action to do that well, do that right, do that thoughtfully. Um, I only think that if that I should be criticized and deeply ashamed if we don't honor our commitments to close that responsibly and look at how we transfer that responsibly to local leadership, local civil society, and take our learning and uh, our own failings and, and successes and apply those uh, going forward, as well as how we continue to transform as an organization. So it's really all about action and doing, as well as thinking and applying our learnings, um, but not waiting and, and talking the talk, walking it. But is the, is the solution that Oxfam just doesn't exist? I mean, we talk all the time about humanitarians should put themselves out of a job, but would you as CEO of Oxfam America be ready to say, in fact, we should not have any international programs? Uh, I, I think this, the, I, 
uh, we were talking about what is local civil society and being network of peers around the world uh, or local to global influencing has been very, very in impactful. And I think that's gone multiple directions. It's a multi-directional thing. And as Oxfam America, we are a US NGO. We work in the United States, but we are also responsible for influencing the US government. And we have historically in the 50 years we've been in, in uh, an entity in the United States, our voice has been about, it's, our genesis was about solidarity. And what do we do? Um, we do not accept US foreign assistance for our work internationally because we want to have the independent voice to influence the United States government who has a disproportionate impact on what happens obviously around the world and in the United States. So about accountability and voice, solidarity, uh, the influencing, I believe there's a role. Uh, I think we need to continue to seriously uh, change and evolve our role over time. Thank you so much. Uzo, I think I stopped you from jumping in earlier. Yeah, I was just gonna say I actually have to run, but I have yeah, I thought <laughs> sorry. <laughs> question. I, I will just say first of all, thank you um, to everybody and to the folks in the audience. Um, I do want to just make the point before I go that I think one thing to remember is, and I and I saw someone's comment about this that, and it, it goes back to narrative that there is a certain impression, like a media generated impression of of like what is correct in terms of and what should work. Uh, in terms of aid and how things should be structured. And that that impression is based off of this idea that, and I will very specifically speak about black people, and this is true of people around the world, but um, in terms of the impression that like, that black people will always be an underclass. That I think it, it's, it's this, this works only if that's what, uh, if what, that's what people believe. And I think, you know, I would just urge us to also take the long view that it's buying into the system if we believe in some way that the west or the north or whatever it is will always be on top that that dominance is permanent that is part and parcel of the narrative that we've absorbed that leads to this idea of a transfer of flows back that that it's money coming from rich countries quote unquote rich countries or from the developed world to the developing world and that we're not thinking about it as the this whole entire ecosystem was actually built off the backs of the resources that were were extracted you know like for the technology and when we say technology technology can also just mean human labor that was transferred to build up some of these systems. Long-term view, I do not, and I will not ever like, you know, agree to believe that black people will be subjugated forever. Um, I think that's just like that I, this whole discussion is predicated on that idea and I reject that notion. And I think we really have to take a long-term view and understand that like we are super resilient, we are extremely resourceful and that we have more than anyone wants to acknowledge, but that we have to get up and say we built uh, we contributed to the building of this world, right? We contributed to the technology that exists, to the resources that exist, to the innovation, the exploration, all that sort of stuff. We're at the center of that. And if we're not acknowledging that, then we'll continue to have this discussion. I just want to make sure that 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 we we say that and that we recognize that as we go forward. Otherwise, um, in terms of how you fix it, I mean, you know. Oh, I just that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just that. Uh, <laughs> I think it's, it is, I, I really, it's about power, really uh, and truly. And I think that the the kumbaya part of me wants to say, like, yes, you know, like we're all going to enter into some sort of phase of wonderful enlightenment, and then resources will be distributed. Uh, the the more realistic part of me uh, says it's really about power, and power has to do with uh, being able to defend and arm yourself against the incursions of people who seek to take what it is that you have whether that's your actual body or your resources that are under the ground beneath your feet or whatever. And I think you will see a real transformation in this dynamic when, for example, people consider African countries to be uh, as much of a threat uh, as, say, I don't know, uh, any one of the quote-unquote rogue states we have here in the world. And not because it's like a terrorist or characteristic threat, but because it's a state-sponsored threat. And that's when I think you have real discussions about how this system is ordered and how it should change. I don't know if I should say that being recorded, but I think it's just, let's just be obvious. It's like, kind of too late. <laughs> so. Those who like dictate the way the system like functions are the ones who generally have the power and the weaponry to, to order that system. And I think long-term, that is what will change the way that this whole thing, how this all happens.
But that's Which comes back to that that notion of kind of, um, well, Dagan said it, uh, many said it, revolution. You know, if this, uh, there has often been this kind of um, uh, threatening narrative of if you don't give it to us, it's going to be taken well, by force, and maybe that's where it lands. You know, uh, that's the way that the world is. That's like let's not let's be very honest with ourselves. Is that's the way that rich country got rich, which was like we're just going to take it, right? And so if you want a reordered system, you have to demand for a reordered system, and there has to be a credible threat of of undoing the system that exists. Um, but, and, so, and, and I, I know we need to wrap soon. So Angela, I think, and, and Dagan, uh, your last kind of thoughts on, on the way forward, and, uh, and then we'll have to call it a day on a very um, complex and, and difficult issue, but it won't be the, the last conversation. So Angela. Yeah, so just, you know, just two things. Um, you know, uh, Abby was talking about um, governments, um, at, about Oxfam and, and, you know, and, and how we work. You know, we don't, Oxfam, Oxfam does not take money from, US, from the US government to work in internationally. But I guess one of the things I wanna say about international organizations and how they interact with governments is that, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of them want access, right? So, um, so when you get access to, to the governments, what are you asking your governments to do? What are we asking governments to do when we talk about, um, so, so getting in is, is great, but when you're in there, what are we asking? Are we asking them to be, um, to look at anti-racist um, uh, issues and policies in the US? Are we asking, when we get to talk to US Congress, do we, are we talking to US Congress about some of the real life things that's going on in this country where black people are hanging from trees today? Um, you know, um, are we talking about the way police shoot down black people in the street every day? When we're talking, when we get the access, what are we asking for? What are we bringing to, to, um, to, to light in some of these conversations with governments? That's one thing. The second thing I wanna say at, to end this is, on my part, is just that for me, as the Black Caribbean person going to work in Haiti, one of the real realities that I had to face was just how white supremacy culture permeates everything, the way we think about aid, the way we think about poor people, the way we think about why are we in this country? And just the very notion of aid says that we are coming from a place where white countries, rich white developed countries, send money to poor black people or poor Asian people or poor Latin Americans. The, there is this ingrained truth about aid, that there's the giver, and the giver is often from a country like the US, and then there's the receiver, the person with their hands out like this. And I think as that being the ingrained way that we understood aid for years, Including is, the recipient countries. Including, including the recipients. There is this, that when white men talk in these NGO meetings, it's the voice of God. That when white men, you know, that, that these people are in charge by intrinsically smarter. So when you bring all of that together, you, you, this notion of putting a sledgehammer to it is, is also putting a sledgehammer to what we've been told for the last mm. 50 years about our existence. As a black girl from the Caribbean, I can tell you that when I sat in Haiti, those people wanted to hear those white men talking because they thought that at the end of the day, those white men knew more, understood more. So when we talk, so if we want to be honest about how we're going to take a sledgehammer to this, we also need to be looking at taking a sledgehammer to what's up here, how we have been socialized to believe that we, that our ideas, what's coming from local people is not that good, not that smart. We're always needed to build their capacity because like Degan said, we've been building capacity for 50 years. Mm -hmm. And so I figured it after 50 years, if we have not built capacity, maybe we say we failed and walk away. Uh, yeah? and, and yet turn it into Bebo. Tobago, if you look at how it handled COVID-19 compared to the United States of America. Thank you. I'm so proud of you for bringing up the fabulous Trinidad and Tobago model. Because for a little country with weakened health systems, Trinidad and Tobago has been able to manage that. And that's exactly the point. We talk about building capacity. We talk about these people as though they have no idea. And I'm thinking to myself, I recently wrote this and I will end here. I say, we need to be humble in development and, aid, and humanitarian aid. Humility is a good thing. Learn to, you need to know that these people 
have in these countries have been doing this work before your aid and they will be doing it when your aid is gone. So when you leave, it's okay. They're going to continue to do what needs to be done. And I will end there. But what I'm sorry, it's also about, about the language. In your comment is that it's, mm, I'm struck yep. that essentially what you're saying is white supremacy exists within black people. That mentality has been embedded even into those who are fundamentally yes. against yes. it. So we, we colonize our own minds. We think that, that this is what we, we, and that's what I meant, that we're complicit. So I agree, the sledgehammer and the healing, both of that, all has to happen to all of us. And yeah, totally agree, Angela. Uh, well, uh, what I was saying is it's got to go in, it's embedded in the language that we use, in, in how we talk about places. You know, and, and, and I think till we start changing that, you know, still um, what we can see and the images that are presented of places, of what a crisis is, of what a precarious nation is, you know, are not simply ones that are located in sort of uh, uh, these stereotypical play, uh, uh, countries, but that say we are all in a precarious situation if one, uh, 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 some country is. You know, that actually points to a language that says it can be applied universally to everybody as if we are all the same, because we are. And uh, this sort of dividing line we have between developed and undeveloped DTC, these are just false, um, yeah, uh, false. models, uh, you know, that we fit countries Absolutely. in, you know, pigeonholes that we put them in that really shouldn't be working. And, and narrative has come up so many times in this conversation, and it uh, um, just reinforces how important our responsibility to get this right is. And I, I mentioned one of the comments we got off the top, but there was another another reader who wrote to us and basically said that, you know, as a news outlet, if we continue perpetuating the, this idea that the only crisis ridden uh, crisis ridden countries are those in Africa, we're also part of the problem. So as I said off the top, you know, this is forcing all of us, I think, to rethink the lenses through which we see things. Uh, I can sense the passion. I think we could talk about this um, for the rest of uh, eternity. I'm going to give the last word to Digan while she is um, giving us her thoughts on how we reimagine and um, actionable next steps. If you have ideas on what we should be reporting about moving forward. Obviously, this is a conversation you can't have in two hours. Um, we have missed parts of that conversation. We will continue to look at these questions. And Candace has already suggested maybe this is a recurring conversation that we have over the coming months. Um, many of you in the audience have said, how do we keep this going? And I, I see that we have a responsibility at the New Humanitarian to, um, to uh, question and interrogate these, these issues. So what should we be looking at moving forward? What should we be keeping in mind? Um, throw your thoughts into the chat and I will uh, turn to Degan. I hope I'm not putting you on the spot for uh, a few last thoughts on uh, the way forward from here. So a couple things. Um, I, I hope this is uh, a little more organized than it is in my head right now. Um, so first thing, uh, hearing Angela speak, um, I think I, I have been called the N-word. I have uh, had uh, white men um, tell me in a public meeting, um, a UN-led meeting, that I am lying about my data and that I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, I have a long a litany of examples of pure, unadulterated racism that I have experienced. However, having said that, and those need to be addressed, and, uh, and the issues of pipeline of leadership, um, it, it needs to be addressed. I, I couldn't afford a, an unpaid internship when I was getting into this business. I remember how humiliating and difficult it was for me to get a job into this aid sector um, and how I felt. And I ha constantly see young black kids when I go to Berlin or I speak at an event, they all gravitate towards me after the event and they say, we're going to these European institutions, uh, the headquarters of these big INGOs, but we're never hired. We're never given an opportunity. So I understand their pain and I'm uh, challenging those of you who work in the international aid sector. I can give you at least a CV of a South African and a Sierra Leonean Young, uh, young people that are ready now with great degrees, great capacity, dynamic to start, start the, into the business and who can't get a break. 
And there's thousands and thousands of those young people out there. So we do need to address that because there is systematic racism. There is preferential treatment that happens with uh, these INGOs and allowing uh, people who can't afford to do unpaid internships. And when they do even take that financial a hardship of taking an unpaid internship, they still don't get absorbed into the system and get a job. Having said that, I think for me, I think we need to look at the structural issues. That's where I always come back to because the pain of being abused and being uh, maligned uh, and being humiliated can only be relieved if I see that my people are getting out of poverty and there's some serious change to the situation. If it's just a matter of me um, just getting a, additional resources and additional funding and the structural issues are not addressed then all of that humiliation that I have gone through is for naught. And so for, that is where I constantly come back to and that is the challenge I have. So Abby, my challenge to you is all this money that Oxfam is saving as a result of COVID and the restructuring that they're doing are you going to fund in the countries that you're remaining and even at a global level, uh, a social justice, civil society, solidarity movement? Is Oxfam gonna take the leadership role that you did with the fair, fair trade movement and, and organizing civil society in the global south, giving us unrestricted funding so we have the courage to go out in the streets and not have to worry about the backlash so we can do the organizing that's needed to start making these demands and putting the sledgehammer to the system. Is Oxfam going to lead in that? Are you also going to uh, provide a system and a pipeline for these young leaders uh, in the global south who are trying to make it into the business? Those are very two simple, clear asks and challenges I have to Oxfam. Uh, Abby, sorry to put you on the spot, but you're, you're going to have to respond. That's great. I would, I would just say, I mean, it's not just Oxfam. Obviously, there are oodles and oodles of organizations out there that can also answer to that challenge. But, but at now, Oxfam, for now, I, I, I have, ahead, yes, no, but I have to say this, Oxfam, in my opinion, I've had a love-hate relationship with Oxfam because on the one hand, they have been an amazing ally on localization and shifting power, and they sometimes and oftentimes practice what they preach. But on the other hand, I don't see the level of serious questioning and reckoning that's required with the system. So there is a disconnect between sometimes the rhetoric and the action. And this is why I'm putting you on the hot seat. Sorry, Abby. No apologies needed, Dagan. I, I appreciate it. And this is exactly why I wanted to be part of this because as Oxfam and my own need to keep learning and keep hearing uh, what would how do we continue to push change and live up to the better side uh, of making positive change? And this, those are both excellent examples and part of what we're talking about substantially, not just of are we shifting the money to the places to go deeper and support social movements and local civil society and activism and social justice, uh, but what we do even as we're leaving the places we are in your second point about the pipeline, what is it about we're looking at that in our own entity as Oxfam America and have to incorporate those kind of learnings into our actions, both on where we are transitioning, leaving, where we are staying, and how we're continuing to evolve. So huge thanks for putting me in on the quote on the spot because that's exactly what we want and need to hear. Um, and we're continuing to push ourselves in that regard. Thanks, Degan. Megan, you've got votes for UN Secretary General uh, in the chat box. So if you're, uh, I'm not sure you'd be interested, but just in case. No, thank um, you. <laughs> thank you all so much. Uh, it feels like we only got started. And uh, as I say, this is the beginning of a conversation. I think there's a whole conversation just around, so what does it mean to take a sledgehammer to the IMF? You know, what does unpacking the, the system look like? Um, and we will be launching um, at the end of this month, this series that I mentioned on rethinking humanitarianism. And so we hope to keep hearing from you and contributing to this um, debate as we move forward. If you have um, ideas around op-eds or commentaries you'd like to submit, um, you can write to hello at the newhumanitarian.org with your ideas. 
Um, if you want to support this kind of journalism and reflection, you can um, sign up to receive our newsletter. You can very soon become a member of the New Humanitarian. We'll be launching a membership program in the coming days. Um, but most importantly, I hope we can continue to be a platform for what I think is the essential conversation um, that the sector needs to be having moving forward. Thank you so much to all of you for uh, a two-hour um, intense conversation. Thanks to all uh, who were listening on Facebook and on Zoom, and we will be in touch.